I have the uh, dubious honor of actually introducing you. You need no introductions, obviously. But we have with us today um, an, an intellectual wealth of development thinking um, with more than, I don't want to say the years, but uh, according to your biographies, more than 30 years of active engagement and understanding of the situation, especially in Africa. One thing we've learned from the global economic crisis is that um, uh, we can't do without government. You know, we need rules. Um, Africa needs rules more than any other continent because its development model is going to be development through natural resources. That's set for the next decade. And development through natural resources requires a lot of rules. The, uh, the unregulated um, process of developing natural resources um, Africa already knows all too clearly, it's plunder. Right? Um, so Africa's development strategy, set not by policy on high, but by what's going to come out of the ground, requires uh, a lot of government involvement, inescapably. That does mean thinking about, first, how government can capture valuable natural resources for the society, and then how it can spend them so that it benefits the future. If we have to mock that process because we're going to call it planning, um, it, there's a difference between managing a process of public resources for development um, and the sort of communist planning that you had to put up with. We know that doesn't work. We equally know refusing to see that the public sector has a role in capturing revenues from resource extraction companies and then investing it in the country's future, refusing to acknowledge that would just be the height of folly. When I referred to the short-sightedness um, of uh, America in 1919, I was partly saying um, sometimes uh, states have interests that they're just too blind to recognize. Yeah? Americans in 1919 refused to recognize that they had a continued interest in the health of Europe. And my goodness, they paid 20 years later for that refusal to recognize it. Now, I believe that the same may be true if we neglect the problems of the bottom billion. If divergence continued for the next 40 years as it has for the last 40 years, in a world that is socially integrating, I think economic divergence would prove to be explosive in ways that we don't even have to anticipate in detail. It would just become unmanageable. Um, so I think the whole of Europe has an interest. It needs to wake up and see it. Um, but you're quite right that, it, that the, the interest that you see that is in your face is the interest of the Balkans and your close neighbors. Now, there are two ways that you can look at that interest. You can either say, that's our interest, let's push that and ignore the other. Right? And if you do that, first of all, let me assure you, you will fail. Right? If there is a tussle between helping the Balkans, helping Moldova, helping North Africa, helping Africa, if there's a tussle within Europe, if that's seen as the choice, do we do this or that, you won't win. Right? But secondly, let me say the way you can win that struggle is to say this is a common generic problem. Europe has a fragile fringe. And a fragile fringe is bad news for all of us. Let's do something about that fragile fringe. Our bit of the fragile fringe that we know about is here. We can tell you about it. We can share our expertise and our insights. Italy, you've got another bit of fragile fringe. Spain, you've got another bit of fragile fringe. But a lot of Europe has fragile fringe. Right? So a common approach will build a consensus in Europe that something needs to be done. A competitive approach, look here, not there, will fail and you will lose. Why is Germany the best run economy in Europe? You probably don't know yourselves. It's very simple, the answer, because it used to be the worst. 
Germany is the one society in Europe that collapsed into economics 101 total mess. It went into hyperinflation. Right? It's about the only society in Europe that really messed up that badly. Right? And that left Germans with a searing memory of how destructive that was. And they came out of it with a sense, never again. Now, across Africa, there is that sense of never again. I go to Africa quite a lot. I've done 12 trips to Africa so far this year. And across Africa, there's a very rich awareness that they've been plundered, and they don't want it to happen again. So Africa is where Germany was 80, 80 years ago or so, never again. Now, Germany actually harnessed that sense of never again, and it did two things which actually changed its economic history. One is it built the institutions, the institutional checks and balances on decisions, which meant that hyperinflation was not going to repeat. If you want to avoid hyperinflation, the institution you build is an independent central bank. That's not what Africa needs. Its decisions are different. But it needs an institution that sets checks and balances on decisions. But institutions, by themselves, are just bits of paper. And the other thing that Germans did was build a critical mass of citizens who understood what that institution was for. Three generations on from hyperinflation, there's still that awareness in German society of avoid inflation at all costs. So what I said to Africans was, what you can learn from Germany is, first of all, you don't have to repeat an awful economic history. And what's the generic solution? You build the institutional checks and balances, and you build a critical mass of citizens who understand what they're for. And your job as African NGOs is to build that critical mass of citizens who understand what they're for and press governments to build them. The, the old former colonial powers fixate upon aid. They actually need to move beyond aid to the full range of policy instruments. But they're coming out of a history where development policy was just trivialized into aid and nothing else. And so it's hard for them to actually think coherently beyond it. You're never going to be big aid providers, but you can engage with development. Just as Andrew Pybels is, he's, he's doing that. Right? And so Eastern Europeans' instincts on development are just going to be better set of instincts. Right? The, you experienced the menu approach. You got money, you got rules, you got governance, you got security. That is, is the approach that should come as second nature to you and should be your contribution to shifting the discourse in the European Commission. And you're playing to, to strength because the commissioner himself will understand that.